and welcome to the fourth and final uh, session in the Wakamasi One STEM Studios Wampum Talk series. Uh, unfortunately, Ashley is not with us tonight, so I'm emerging from behind my usual curtain to fill in. Uh, today's session is entitled Life Insurance, uh, Understand Why Life Insurance Policies Help Secure Your Family's Future. Um, the SIM Studio program is very thankful for our moderator and speaker for joining us tonight and freely giving of their time, talent, and treasures for the session. Um, our moderator tonight is Ms. Theresa Blanks. Uh, she's an, been an educator for 30 years, member of St. James Missionary Baptist Church. Um, Ms. Blanks is married to Hubert Blanks and the mother of Deirdre Blanks, uh, Dr. Deirdre Blanks and Dr. Anson Blanks. Um, she's also a proud grandmother of three, Callie, Connor, and Jameson. Um, Ms. Teresa continues to be an important part of our community and a role model to us all. Um, he's personally very important to me and my family as well. So we're very thankful to have you here for us uh, with us tonight. And with that, I'm going to give it over to Ms. Blanks. And I'm going to say hello to all of you tonight. And I'd say thank you so much for allowing me to be here for to be your moderator. And thank you so much, Cody, for all your help. And Ashley, I have to give a special thanks to you. And our speaker tonight will be Jonathan Graham. And Lord, he is an excellent speaker and he is sp very special to me. So he will introduce himself and he will be discussing or talking concerning life insurance. And I'm going to give it over to Jonathan because he will be telling you about himself. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Aunt Theresa said, um, my name is Jonathan Graham. Um, I'm a member of the uh, Waccamaw Suwon tribe out of St. James, uh, North Carolina. Um, I'm married. I have two kids, Corey and Cadence, married to Jennifer. Um, let's see where I want to go from here. Um, I'm a member of St. James Baptist Church as well. Um, Proud of the community and proud of the STEM studio and all the good work we've done. Um, this is, as Aunt Theresa said, the last installment of our uh, Wampum Talks. Um, this will concern life insurance and the popular types of life insurance you already know about and, and also the uh, types of insurance you don't know about, or maybe you don't know as much about. Um, the topic is near and dear to me because you know, there's a real, we've been real neglectful um, in our community concerning insurance. Um, it hasn't been talked about enough, hasn't been taught enough. And our community has kind of, I don't want to say left behind, but we haven't been up on the insurance game. And I call it a game because there is some gameplay involved as some of the other communities are. So uh, the thought process behind this talk, in addition to the other talks we've conducted over the last month or so, maybe a little better than a month, um, is looking to bridge the gap in some of those knowledge areas. Um, you know, uh, Ashley Lomboy and myself, and I, I'm not going to name anybody else because I don't want to leave anybody out. Um, but we've been working on this for the better part of six months to a year. Um, just making sure that we cover the areas that are applicable to the community that we are a part of and that we are looking to help. Um, so that was the idea behind the Wampum Talks from the very beginning. Um, so a lot of, I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, a lot of work and energy and meetings and Zoom meetings went into this discussion. So I hope that if you didn't get a chance to watch it live, you'll go back and watch it and apply it as needed. Uh, the idea was to put all this information out so it would be stored. So when it gets further along the line, you'll have it. Everybody should have life insurance. You know, the GoFundMe insurance policy, I'm sure you've seen it all. We've all seen it. You know, circumstances sometimes uh, dictate or say that they're necessary. But there's also many, many instances where it's just a lack of pure preparation. Uh, I always say, uh, none of us are getting out of this alive. As sure as you are born, you will die. And I don't know any other way to say it, um, but to just say it, it's true. We're, we're, none of us are getting out of this alive. Um, so we need to be prepared 
for that transition and not put it all on the, on the next generation. So um, more about me. Um, I'm an engineer by day, but I'm also a project management professional by daytime as well. I serve two hats. Um, I know more about insurance, not really because of my job, but because it's just something that has interest me over the years to know about. Um, so I got selected to speak about this with you all. So bear with me. If there's a topic area I don't know as much about, I'll be honest and I'll let you know I don't know as much about it. But I've tried to be well informed for this. So with that, we'll get right into it. Uh, we've prepared a slide deck to go along with the talking points. Number one, to ensure we cover everything. And number two, to ensure I don't keep you here all night. So with that, we'll get into it. All right, insurance in you, this deck was created by me. And one thing I forgot to put on here, this, this presentation in no way reflects financial decisions, advice. I'm not telling you to go out and do anything. I don't advertise for any insurance company. I have no affiliation with any of these people. This is strictly a knowledge-based thing um, to fill in a gap within our community. I had to put that out there. Hey, Jonathan, can you click the present button so that it blows the slides up? Right, you can probably hit F5 on your keyboard. Hmm, where are we at? Where at, where at, Cody? Um, you can try F5. Just hit the F5 key. Does that work? Nah. Okay. Um, at the very top of the screen next to the save button, there looks like that little presentation. Next to the save button here, right here? Oh, no, at the... Uh, I was looking to see if it would be in there. Go up in the in the toolbar, the orange part. Mm -hmm. It's the fourth icon to the yeah. Right here. Uh left two. Or there. One more. There. That one, I think. All right, let's see. Yeah. That, yep, there we go. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I started you over, but that was big. <laughs> Thank hey, you. Hey, no worries, man. We'll talk through it. All right. I'll go through it with the arrows. So we've been through here. Okay. Let's get back on top. Um, why is life insurance important? Um, life insurance is important because when we die or when we get sick or whatever, it always leaves a burden on the family left behind or the family in charge of your estate or whoever, how, whatever your system is for, for putting that action in place. Um, what's happened over the years in our communities is we don't have an action. We don't have a plan in place to help with these things. And so it creates a problem for the estate, taxes, finances, you know, loans, all of that stuff doesn't stop just because you die. You know, you stop, but the bills don't stop. They have to go somewhere. So um, we're going to cover the types of insurance you can get to help you address these issues. Um, we're going to cover one, yeah, seven different types tonight. And I'm gonna talk through some more than others. Uh, some of the ones that are less uh, popular and frankly, you may not even really be that interested in. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it. So we're gonna move on here. Um, we've already been doing introduction, but insurance in you, why is it important? Um, as we talked about, it's important to sell your estate after you die. Because if you don't settle your estate, the people that you leave behind will have to settle it. It doesn't just stop because you pass away. Uh, accumulated wealth. This is a big one. Um, a lot of folks, I'm not going to name any areas of, of types of people, but this is the one that a lot of folks miss out on. You know, a lot of times the younger you buy the insurance, the cheaper it is. There's no quicker way to set up your next generation and to have a life insurance policy that helps do that when you pass away. And you will pass away at some point. Uh, asset protection. If you have assets like a home or a car or classic automobile you like, anything that has value, um, once, your, once your estate goes into probate, 
And if you and you owe money, the creditors don't just come after what's in your bank account. If that doesn't cover it, they go after the assets. Estate protection, same deal. If you have property, you have land, it's not in a trust, it's just up there, you just own it. The first thing that all of these loan, loan collection agencies go for is the estate, anything involved in the estate. Moving on. Um, this is just a slide to, dict to uh, give an explanation, you know, to how many people are covered by insurance. So, so around half are covered by some type of life insurance, but 100% of these people are going to die. So truth may want to think about that. Um, we're getting now into the types of um, life insurance. The most common type of life insurance is term life. Term life insurance is the simplest and most affordable insurance. It provides coverage for a specific period of time, also known as the term. If you die during the policy term, your beneficiaries receive a death benefit, which is the insurance itself. Um, just to add one or two little things about term life, um, it's literally exactly what it sounds like. You buy or get a 20 or 30 year policy. It's good for 20 or 30 years. Here's the problem with term life that you run into sometimes. Most people, especially when you're working age, like I am, you get term life through your employer. Well, if you quit or you resign or you're fired or you're terminated or laid off, they don't just lay, they're not just laying off your money. They're also laying off that insurance that you pay for. So that term is only as good as the job you have if you get it through your employer. So it's important to make sure that you have a term policy um, not affiliated with your employer as well as one aff affiliated with your um, employer. So just something to think about is job related. Um, they, there's other term policies that you can get through large companies. I'm not gonna name them because again, I'm not advertising for anybody, but you can Google. There's plenty of policies out there that, are, uh, that offer term, friendly term limits. And like I said, the longer the policy and the younger you are when you get it, the cheaper it is. And normally they come with pretty high payouts as well. So it's a good thing to have at your disposal, but there are things you need to understand about the term life. Um, the top three, I know I've started talking about this a little bit already. Uh, the top three term life insurance programs are 30, 30 year, 20 year, and 10 year. Um, as you can see from the slide, you the 30 year term is the longest length of term life insurance. Now, it's, it, it's, it's good like they're saying for income replacement and covering 30 year mortgages, but it's also good. I always look at it. If you have a younger family like I do and you just want that security until they're gone and out of the house and you're not worried about leaving um, people behind in, in, in need. Uh, that's a good way to do it. And also the rates are usually better for that 30 year policy. The 20 year term is the most popular, popular choice. Um, typically, typically chosen by people in their forties and fifties. Um, I'm guessing that, that those folks do that because maybe they don't think they're going to live the 30 years. I can't, comment to that, but um, that's the most common term of term life is the 20 year. And then the 10 year is most commonly purchased short term life insurance, 50 and above. Um, you can use your imagination about why they, why they purchase 10 year, but it's not just because they're closer to needing it. It's also because as, as you all should know, um, the older you get, the more, it's sure, the more expensive the insurance. Um, so that 10 year term, a lot of folks in their 50s and 60s, that's all they can qualify to get and be able to still eat every month. So that's typically why you see that. Um, a little more about term, term life. Term life insurance guarantees payment of a stated death benefit 
to the beneficiaries if the insured person dies during the term. So you got to die while you have the term life. If you die 40 years and you had a 30 term, 30 year term life insurance policy, you're out of luck. Um, these policies have no value other than the guaranteed death benefit savings component as is, as is, as is found in a whole life insurance product. So you can't borrow money against them. They're just, you pay by the month and they guarantee you a, a payout. It's not an elevated savings plan. You can't borrow against it to buy a car or any of that other wild stuff that you see. Um, term life premiums are based on a person's age, health, and life expectancy. So the longer you wait to buy it, the more expensive it gets. And if you wait until you have 15 pre existing conditions, it's obviously going to be more expensive. So the younger you get it, the better. Depending on the company, it may be possible to turn term life into whole life insurance. You're going to see why that's beneficial in just a few minutes. And like we said, you can purchase term life policies that last 10, 15, or 20 years. And yes, you can um, purchase one for 30 years. Whole life insurance. Whole life insurance works as a permanent policy that builds cash value as it ages. If the premiums are kept current, the policy remains active for the entire uh, duration and the beneficiaries will receive a set death benefit upon death. Um, whole life insurance can in fact be cashed out and you can receive dividends uh, from the policy. And whole life can be advantageous for uh, tax reasons. So I'm not going to talk much on the top because I think that's pretty self-explanatory. The ability to be cashed out. Let's talk about that a little bit. So whole life policies, yes, can be cashed out before you die. And dividends can be received. Now, hopefully everybody understands what a dividend is. But if you don't, I'll walk through it real quick. Um, a dividend is when you have an investment or you have any kind of investment, whether it's 401k or a stock, whatever the turnover there is every month, up and down, fluctuate, a percentage can be paid to you uh, in the form of a check, direct deposit or whatever. And it's usually not going to be more than a couple of dollars or so, but that's what they mean by a dividend being received. Uh, you can receive dividends depending on how you have your whole life policy set up. Um, and as far as cashing out is concerned, you can cash out of your whole life policy. But here's the problem. Let's say you're 65 years old, you haven't died yet, and you want to cash out of your whole life policy. You want to get your money now. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, you're still going to die. And now you're 65 years old and you don't have insurance. If you decide you want to go get insurance now, guess what? The rate that you got 30 years ago when you got this whole life policy is not going to be the same rate that you get again. So yes, maybe you can cash it out, but it's highly, highly not a good idea to do so. And just jumping the gun a little bit. Um, disadvantages to whole life insurance. It's expensive. Yes, we forgot to talk about that. Um, whole life is more is more expensive than term life. So if you can't predict when you're going to die and you want to ensure that your whole life is covered, see the game play that I was talking about, it's more expensive. So it just depends on your gambling, how, how you want to gamble. Can you predict how, don't, how long you're going to live? I know that sounds crazy, but that's literally how it works. The people who think they can predict how long they're going to live can get a term policy for cheaper than you can get a whole life policy. Um, it's not as flexible as other permanent policies like we talked about. You can cash it out and you can receive dividends, but that's really all you can do to it. Um, there's not much more uh, incentive wise to have that whole life policy other than to guarantee your whole life you have insurance. Um, it can take a long time to build cash value. Again, they're thinking whole life. It's not a term. It's not a term policy. 
It's not a universal policy. So it's not going to just build, you know, value overnight, uh, like some people say. And I know you see on Facebook and other media things where they talk about borrowing against your life insurance to do this and that and that. But there's a lot of things you have to understand about how these policies work. And it's not all that you see on infomercial and see on videos. I see all kinds of nonsense that just aren't true. Um, it's loans are subject to interest. Uh-huh, a big one. So let's say you get in trouble and decide you need to borrow some money or get your whole life policy. Um, yes, you can. You can borrow money against your whole life policy, but you will pay it back. And yes, you do pay it back to yourself, but you will pay interest back as well. So it's going to cost you money. Even though you're paying money to yourself, technically, you're still going to pay um, not so super high interest, but likely it'll be a little higher than your traditional loan rate, depending on your credit. Can I interrupt you, John? Go ahead, Aunt Free. Um, Well, you're talking about the borrowing against it. If mm. I borrow against it, will I it happen to die? Do I collect my complete insurance money? So what you collect, so what, that's a great question. Um, the way I understand it, and I've, I've actually done, I've seen it two ways since I've been doing my research on this. And what, they, what it says is there's two options. The first option is the whole balance of the loan can become due and then they subtract it away. That's option one. Or the second option is, it just falls into default like the rest of your bills do when you don't pay them after you die. And then that comes back to the estate and it's almost like you didn't have life insurance. So don't die while you have your loan. <laughs> I hate to say it like that, but you know, it's, it's not a good idea to pass away. It's not a good time to pass away if you, if you owe money to your life insurance policy, mm -hmm. you should probably take pretty good care of yourself during that time. Um, I don't mean to joke about it, but it's true. That's the way this system is uh, is set up. It's set up like that. Um, and the last line, <laughs> and literally the last bullet point to follow on your comment, it's not always the best investment choice. And that's why, because, you know, there's certain restrictions, like if you die while, before you pay it back, that's a big problem. So. Yeah, the, the best thing to do is to just not pass away. Okay. <laughs> That's wild. All right. And here, and here we have just a slide. I like, I like this graphic. You can see the differences between term life and whole life. So the font's a little small, but everybody should take the time to review this because it literally spells it out for you right here. And the big thing to take from this, um, the lower premium for the term life, the time, um, the term life um, has a max age. We didn't talk about that. Um, typically, you can't get a policy if you're past 80 years old. And it's simple. They don't believe you're going to live that long. Um, as for the uh, whole life, cash value can be assessed if needed for any reason and can provide guaranteed income after retirement. So you can get access to the cash value of, on the whole life policy. But depending on who you get or who you under who underwrites the policy for you, the terms and the limitations of that policy, you need to be reading the fine print. All right. All right, moving on. Um, we'll talk about universal life insurance. Um, universal life insurance policies are a form of permanent life insurance with premiums. I can't read that part. Unlike term life, um, universal life can accumulate interest bearing funds and policyholders can adjust their premiums and death benefits and holders uh, can put the premium towards the interest on that excess. Um, it also offers protection for a longer term than a term policy. And your beneficiaries do also get the death benefit, not the death benefit plus the cash value. 
And some policies will include cash value in the payout, but are not, but they are not more normally much more expensive, or they are much more expensive. So universal life, this is the one that you see advertised all over Facebook. Um, you do accumulate interest. You can invest the policy. You can receive interest. Um, you can get a longer term than a term policy, um, protection-wise. And your beneficiary still will get the death benefit, but they won't get the cash value and the death benefit. Um, some policies will put it in the payout, which it said. But again, to get that addendum put into your policy, it makes the policy itself much more expensive. And I can tell you from experience that with this policy, they look at the time in which you get it. So at 40 years old, your term is noticeably more expensive than it would have been if you got it at 25. It's not necessarily waiting until you get 50 before it becomes expensive. If you're going to get a universal policy, you really should get it, or at least think about getting it as soon as you start working, um, if you can handle it cost-wise, because this policy is more costly than your traditional whole life policy. Variable, variable life insurance. A variable life insurance policy is a contract between, between you and an insurance carrier, and it is intended to meet certain insurance needs, investment goals, and tax uh, objectives. It is a policy that pays a specified amount to your family or to other beneficiaries when you die. Um, if the investment options you select for your policy perform poorly, you'll lose money, including your initial investment. This is the most risky insurance policy you can have because it's literally an open-ended policy um, that you can literally tie to the market. Now, if the market performs well, the life insurance goes up. If the market per performs poorly, your insurance policy goes down. If you die when it's down, then you didn't die at a good time. Um, if it performs so poorly that you didn't, that you lose the money that you initially put into the policy, um, then that can't happen. They will take your money. So you need to be paying real close attention to the market if you have a variable policy. And one thing that's not on these decks that I notice about the variable life insurance is even if you have the policy already in place and you decide that you don't want to, you know, you don't, let's say the market's up and you decide, hey, I want to cash out of my policy or, hey, I want to convert it into something else. There are restrictions depending on the companies that they can put on these policies to ensure that you don't overly benefit from it. So if you're gonna get a variable policy, I suggest you read the fine print on that policy. Don't just take anybody's word for it. Make sure you read the writing, the little print, not the big print. Could I ask one more question? Yes, ma'am. Um, is it, as an older person or a young person, I guess I should say, is it, it's not good to invest this rather than save your money in the bank or vice versa? So I would say, um, I wouldn't say good. I wouldn't say bad. I would say what's right for you. Um, how risky are you? What is the market doing? Um, that's one of those questions that you should sit down with your plan, with your estate planner and, and kind of discuss because there, in a way, the variable life insurance offers a way for you to make money, but it's incredibly risky. Now, for me personally, if I'm going to use this, I don't know why I wouldn't just invest my money in the market to start with. Okay. Because, you know, you're putting your money in, a, they're calling it a variable life policy. But what they're really doing is putting your money into a Roth, almost like a Roth, and they're restricting the way you can convert it or move it around after the fact. Whereas if you just directly invested your money yourself, when you want to get out, you can just boogie. So 
I don't know that I would use it um, in that manner. Um, I don't know how much more expensive the terms would be, you know, as opposed to your age. Didn't find a lot of details about that. It seems like that initial investment amount is what drives what the terms will be for your policy. So I should think before I invest Always. as money. Always. Okay. Thank um, you. You know, everybody's circumstances are different, but, yes. um, you know, if you have money that you can put up front and, you know, you're almost, to me, you're almost better off to just go it alone rather than get involved in a variable policy that will restrict what you can do with your money after you make it. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. All Great. right. Okay. And to, to move kind of into what you were just saying, um, the variable life versus the variable universal life, uh, you can kind of see the differences. Um, the variable life policy has, you have those investment fund management fees because again, they look at this like it's an investment. They're not really looking at it like it's life insurance. So you have those fees that are similar to what you would have if you had a traditional Roth or, or a 401k plan or any kind of investment strategy fund or manager. The payout and the way it looks is the same. Um, but also that comes with that, you have greater accumulation of cash value. So you can make more money. Um, it cannot be invested and guaranteed death benefit requires higher premiums. So yeah, you're gonna put the money up, you know, but also the higher premiums, you're gonna pay more to have that type of policy. The universal policy accumulates loan interest, has an available cash value for you to borrow against or whatever you wanna do. And then you have investment options you can choose fund, sim similar to any kind of investment strategy that blends stocks, mutual funds, and things of that nature. And then you have the flexible death benefits and premiums. All right. Burial life insurance. Now, this one right here is a good one. Um, burial life insurance. Burial life insurance covers the cost of your funeral and or cremation expenses after you pass away. It can also be used at the beneficiary's discretion to pay off debts, including any medical bills, mortgage loans, or credit card bills. Um, it is really a whole life policy because the term covers you for life and it is used to put you away and remove all expenses so you can rest in peace while also allowing your family members to rest while living. And y'all can bet, yes, that is my quote at the end. I didn't buy that off the internet. Um, burial insurance is a good thing to have because um, typically, you know, when you die, it's a very, very emotional time for your family. And people aren't always thinking in the clearest of heads about things that they do when they pass away, um, you know, when somebody passes away. So a lot of times, you know, you see the really, really nice caskets and sprays and you're buying the best of the best. And then we take it out there and bury it in the ground. Um, you know, having this insurance, you know, ensures that no matter how big baller you wanna go on putting somebody away, um, you have this at your disposal um, to make sure that you're not going into, you know, your, your savings or whatever to pay off those debts incurred by the funeral home. Um, but it also can be used to cover medical expenses. So if you happen to have went, you know, for an ambulance ride before you took that big sleep, um, you know, it'll cover that. Mortgage loans, did you leave a 30-year loan on your house? It'll cover that. Credit card bills. Did you go out and run up a lot of credit card debt um, before you passed away? Like I said, the creditors, you know, they'll call looking for you. You'll answer the phone. Hey, your bill is due. Oh, well, he passed away. 
I'm sorry for your loss, but we'll expect payment by the first. That's the way that works. So um, the burial policy will cover all of that stuff. And to me, it's downright irresponsible not to have at least this much. Uh, you need to have enough to put you away. We're all going to need to be put away. Uh, so if you don't do anything else or hear anything else I said tonight, some of it was, you know, trying to make light of this situation because it's never easy to talk about death. But um, if you don't hear anything else, I said, get a burial policy. And you don't need $100,000 for a burial policy. Get enough to save your family that burden when you pass away. Um, it, it is really a, a whole life policy because the term typically covers you for life and is used to put you away. So um, it's similar to a whole life policy. And, you know, that's what it does. I suggest everybody have at least that much. Okay, so on this slide, you see um, pros and cons of life insurance for funeral expenses. So the first one and the big one is no medical exam, therefore easier approval. So if you have pre-existing conditions, you can in fact still get a policy. This is the type of policy you'll wanna get. Um, permanent policy that lasts your entire lifetime. So you don't have to worry about it. It's there, you have it. And the low monthly premiums, it's not super expensive, okay? Cons. If you live longer than expected, you may end up paying more in premiums than the value of your death benefit. So what that means, um, if you go, and I'm gonna just do some simple arithmetic here. Let's say you go out and get a policy and your policy says, hey, you know what? We want $30 a month, right? $30 a month for your burial policy and the payout's $10,000. So if you're 30 years old and you live 30 years, I'm gonna do some math here and you can't see me doing it, but I promise you, I'm gonna calculate it right on the spot for you. This is what that means. So if you're 30 years old, let's say you live 30 years. So 12 months in a year times 30 is 360, right? So 360 months times 30. I'm gonna project it. Uh, I'm not gonna project it. That's $10,800, okay? If your payout is $10,000, you literally pay more than the policy is going to pay out. That's what that slide means by paying more in premiums and the value of your death benefit. So you wanna think about that whenever you're setting it up or you're shopping for a policy, um, it's something you wanna think about. And y'all hold on one second, I gotta plug my computer in. I'm going to go on mute real quick, Cody. I think he might have waited a little bit too long. <laughs> I think it died on him. <laughs> <laughs> well. I guess we're going to give them a few minutes to rejoin us. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. There we go. Some lights on in here. <laughs> uh, um, I did drop into the uh, chat. I put a message that um, you might want to check with your bank or your credit union um, to see if they offer any financial um, planning services. Um, we bank with uh, Coastal Federal Credit Union, which is like there's a bunch of branches around Raleigh. Um, I just checked there's not one really close to you, but um, they have a financial planning um, plan that you can participate in. Any of the members of the credit union can for free. Um, that they financial do the plan, same thing at the state employees credit union too. They have yeah. a financial plan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so but I'm at that age now. You can't, you can't, I can't look at a death benefit and decide I'm going to outlive it. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I could decide. I don't know whether I would. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, but for anybody else that's, uh, that comes back and listens later, um, that's probably a good place to start if you want to start thinking about financial planning. Um, depending on where you go, usually those plans could cost you between $1,000 and $1,500. So 
having a free benefit like that from a credit union is fantastic. Um, we did it a few years ago whenever the kids were small and helped us project um, how much money we needed for college, how, many, how much we needed to save, what type of life insurance we might want to look at in addition to what my employer offers and all that kind of stuff. So very insightful conversations. Thought he'd be back by now. There we go. I'm going to drop back off. I'm back, guys. Great. Can everybody okay. hear me? Yes. Okay. Can't see you, though. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming back. There you go. <laughs> My computer decided it didn't want to participate for a second. All right. So um, let's see here. Mm. All right. That's it. All right, I'm going to go back. Out, out three, you remember what slide we stopped on? Uh, yeah, pros and cons. Pros and cons. There we go. There you are. Mm -hmm. yeah, I love talking about this stuff here. All right, so yes. Um, All right, um, I'm back. So um, the pros of this policy to me outweigh the cons, but there are cons. Um, like we talked about, if you live, outlive the payout of the premium, uh, maybe you pay a little bit more than you should uh, for the policy when you first get it, or uh, you live so long that you paid so much in premiums that outweighs the death benefit. And maybe you could have done better by putting the money in the bank. Um, that doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad investment because it doesn't matter what you would have did with the money. It matters what you do with the money. So if you don't put it aside and you don't save it for when you die, it still leaves the same bill. So um, it's a con, but at the same time, it's something we all need to consider uh, just, a part of, just as a part of uh, regular life maintenance, as I call it. Um, and the last thing here is uh, you may be able to qualify for life insurance with a higher death benefit. So what that means is um, typically these burial policies have limits on how much they can be written for. I'm not really familiar. I know depending on who you get them with, the limits are different, but usually a term life policy, a typical term life policy, you can go three, four, five hundred thousand um, dollars for that policy because it's a term and a lot of people plan and a lot of carriers and insurance companies and companies, they plan on you outliving that term. That's how they make their money. They're saying, well, you're probably not going to die in 20 years. We're just going to collect your premiums and then we're never going to pay it out. And at the end of the term, you get nothing for it. Um, except the idea that you had insurance. The burial policy, there's a 100% chance there's going to be a, a payout made to that policy. So they're not going to let you just walk into an insurance company and no underwriter with their mind, you know, correct here is going to allow you to walk in there and take out a $500,000 burial policy. Because there's a 100% chance that insurance companies are going to have to make good on that policy because everybody's going to die and they know it. So they typically will try and limit the amount that you could take it out for. Having said that, you need to have at least enough insurance to put you away after you pass away. It's your responsibility. It's not the responsibility of your family. It's not your parents' responsibility. It's not your children's responsibility. It's your responsibility to get insurance and do what you need to do as a part of regular life maintenance. Just want to drive that home. So uh, survivorship, 
life insurance. A survivorship policy is a form of joint life insurance. This is a life insurance policy that you get with your partner, your spouse, whatever. In a first to die policy, the life insurance company pays a benefit after the first insured person dies. Second to die policies are more commonly called survivorship policies and the benefit is only paid out after the second spouse pass or second person passes away. So you both got to die to get at to, to get access to the benefits. Um, it can be helpful in the state planning if you want to leave a benefit for heirs. It's helpful for dependent children or even if you wanted to leave your money to charity. Um, although married couples typically have this coverage, the joint policy holders are not required to be legally married. And so in this day of, of you know, different types of marriages and partnerships, that's very important. Um, this insurance is usually found in trusts and things of that nature. Trusts. Um, a lot of us in our community are not really up on the trust game. We're lagging behind. Um, it's one of those things we need to get up on in which you leave all of your estate and your property and your assets in a trust as opposed to just leaving it in a, in a, in a spot and letting your children and your heirs fight over who's getting what, which is never a good thing. Second to die life insurance perks. There are some perks. Uh, it's less expensive than two individual policies. Yes, it costs less money. Um, it's more lenient in underwriting guidelines. What does that mean? They don't scrutinize it as healthy as, they don't scrutinize it as much as they do other life insurance policies. Um, spend thrift clause, systematic, systematic payments to beneficiaries by trustee, and the trustee can pay beneficiaries rent bills directly. So the third party, so let's say you have a scenario where one party is incapacitated when the other one dies. This allows the other beneficiary to make and pay the rent and bills directly. Okay, mortgage life insurance. A mortgage life insurance policy is a term policy Excuse me, let me turn the light. Okay. A mortgage life insurance policy is a term life policy designed specifically to repay mortgage debts and associated costs in the event of the borrower. Um, I'm going to stop right there and talk directly to you a little bit. I had to move my computer over because it's it, for some reason it's needing to be plugged in. Um, this policy usually, usually as me and Aunt Theresa were talking before the meeting, it used to be required by your lender to get mortgage life insurance because believe it or not, there was a point where banks didn't want to take possession of properties after they've already put a mortgage on them. One thing everyone needs to understand with the rising and of property values and all of that, these banks are not going to be as inclined to encourage you to get mortgage life insurance because they don't mind taking the properties back. So as the housing market rises, the less encouraging they'll be about getting a mortgage policy because they'd love to take your house back. So it's one of those things you need to make sure when you're signing on the dotted line on that beautiful home, you need to make sure you're getting some mortgage life insurance uh, with that home. It's typically not too expensive when you get it um, at the beginning. I know it's a little more expensive if you try to get it added on later. Um, these policies differ from traditional life insurance policy with a traditional life insurance policy the death benefit is paid out when the borrower dies. Simple as that. You sign on the line for your mortgage, you go out, you get hit by a truck, you die. The insurance policy pays that mortgage off and voila, your family gets their family home to live in even after you have passed away. Right. Um, 
a home. Why is that important? And this is just me. I didn't take this off the internet. Um, a home is typically the most expensive asset owned by any person. Typically, not always, but usually the home is the most important item you'll ever own. You need to protect it with a mortgage policy. Um, the insurance ins assures that this asset goes to the estate and the heirs and not back to the bank by default. Again, if you don't pay the loan off, somebody else has to pay it. If there's nobody who can pay it or willing to pay it, it goes back to the bank. It's not a good thing. Um, and I can tell you this, um, there's nothing more nerve wracking during your estate planning after someone passes away than figuring out how to pay for mom's house. So do yourself a, pay, a favor. When you're signing all those documents, when you get a loan, you're gonna sign up, it's gonna be this thick. You're signing all these paper, all this paperwork. Make sure you get a mortgage policy because it's not some some places they require it, but a lot of places do not require mortgage life insurance. It's important to have that if you're a homeowner. And the way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Go out and get you some life insurance, folks. This is us. Um, no matter what policy you decide to get for your family, uh, it's one of the most selfless things you can do is to get a good life insurance policy. Typically, I don't get into the whole what type of policy you get. Every, everybody's needs are different. Every family has different needs and wants. There's some people who like to play a little more than, than others. I'm one of those people. There's people who like to take risks more than others. I'm one of those people too. Um, but a few dollars a, a month, you know, can save your family a whole lot of heartache after you pass away and you will pass away. So, you know, just something to think about. You know, you can give up one or two cups of coffee from Starbucks a month and literally save your family from having to worry about any of this stuff after you pass away. And it happens all the time. As we stated earlier in this deck, um, in this presentation, only half of America has life insurance of any kind. Don't you be on the wrong half of that. That's me, my email address, resources. This is our uh, STEM Studio email address. You can follow us on Facebook. Uh, a lot of you guys probably already do. Hence why you're here in the first place. Um, again, I'll just reiterate one more time. Life insurance is important. We need to have it. We need to get away from the GoFundMe insurance. That is not insurance, guys. Um, we need to focus more on taking care of our business when it comes to this. And we're lagging behind in doing so. Um, STEM Studio, you know, we, we've done a lot of cool things with the kids. Um, we've done things to build the community in a lot of different ways. Um, but this is one of those things that has needed to be addressed within our community for a long time. Um, if, if only one person goes out tomorrow and gets a policy, it'll make all this work worth it. So um, do we have any questions? I'm going to go on mute, Arthur. Are you going mute? Um, so you're telling me everyone, every, no matter who you are, would need burial insurance of some kind. Unless yes. you're winning that Powerball. Yes, All sir. right. I, I just want to make sure I was understanding. Mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about whole life, explain you were talking about the tax reasons I, I i didn't quite understand for the tax reasons all right let's see whole life whole life yes right here mm -hmm. all right so whole life can be advantageous for tax reasons um the main reason that that can be is because, remember, what do you pay taxes on, you know, when, not when you, well, I guess I'll say when you die. 
Um, mm -hmm. The state pays certain taxes, right? Okay. So how do I say this and not sound crass? If you cash your policy out before you die, what are you paying taxes on? You got to pay for that policy. I got you. Okay, gotcha. that's what I didn't understand. Yeah, and a All lot, right. what a lot of people will do is cash out on the money. Like typically, when the administration changes over throughout the years, uh, you'll see a lot of times they'll fool around with the burial of state tax, um, state to state, federal government. Sometimes um, they'll be in a state tax. Well, right. that's not relegated just to your property. It also counts to any income received by the estate. That's how whole life pays out. It pays to the estate. So that's why okay. I say if you cash out before you die, you don't pay that tax. Okay. I got you. I was I understand. And I can't see Cody. I don't know if you can see on the group. I'm I don't have it open. Um yeah, I don't see any questions. No questions? Okay, um, like I said, we, we're running at about right at an hour. That's perfect. Um, yep, three minutes. So um, anybody has any questions, you can reach out to me on Facebook. Or you can reach out to anybody here on Facebook. And that's my email address. Email me any questions you may have after the fact. If you're viewing this presentation after the fact and um, you need to ask questions, I'm available to ask those questions. I might not have all the answers, but there's a thing called Google. <laughs> we can get the answers for you. Thank you so much. Anything else? Uh, just that while you were gone, we talked about um, options available through credit unions, potentially, to have financial planning done at no cost uh, for credit union members. Yes. So that's a, a great first step to get started if somebody's thinking about planning for your future uh, not just life insurance but also planning for retirement and all that jazz um, definitely reach out to a financial planner and and um, make sure you get a fiduciary <laughs> so that they for, for sure, because remember you're not going to be around to, to put this thing in place so yep. um yeah and that's the perfect time to do it when you're planning for your retirement your 401k uh, when you're starting to get all of that stuff together, um, hopefully you already have your life insurance, but if you don't have it, you better be getting it right then. Um, and the longer you wait, the more expensive it is. Okay. And, you know, stop your sharing. Where we are. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we should uh, have a, a conversation which we could talk off offline about, but um, talking about building trust and having trust to build family wealth. Um, that's something I've been reading into quite a bit, a bit lately. Um, and it's a pretty interesting topic that we could probably have a whole nother session on. I, I honestly, I didn't get much into the trust part on purpose mm -hmm. because that was the very next thing. Uh, yeah. I wanted to have another presentation about, are we still live? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting ready to wrap up. We're, we're coming yeah, out right yeah. on now. <laughs> trust that, that conversation is not going to happen tonight. <laughs> yeah. All right. Talking so if you don't have any other, people. if you don't have any other comments, then um, as we're wrapping up for the session now, uh, I'd like to remind everybody that Saturday is our soil testing day. So if you're one of the almost 100 families that we got signed up for getting your soil tested, um, a scientist and community liaison, and potentially a few students um, or a few of our youth will be visiting your property to take a soil sample. Uh, you don't need to be at home, and they will leave a paper. Um, hanger on your door once they've been there. Um, so sometime on Saturday, somebody will be swinging by your house if you registered to have your soul tested. Um, so that's it. Uh, I'd like to say thanks again to all of our speakers and moderators that have joined um, for this whole Wampum Talk series um, to make our series a success. As Jonathan said, um, we really hope that you found some value in our sessions. Um, and please don't forget that the recordings are available. Um, they're on Facebook and also on YouTube or will be on YouTube um, sometime shortly. So you have access to that and you can also get access to the presentation if you'd like that too. Um, 
So again, we pre appreciate everybody's support of the STEM Studio program. Um, we depend on all of your support and interest to keep the program going and being successful. Um, without you, there's no reason for us to do things like this. So um, share a word of appreciation to your program sponsor. Uh, Ashley does a whole lot of work, <laughs> a whole lot of hours yes. in the week to make these things happen. Um, so if you could drop a word of encouragement, that would be fantastic. Um, we look forward to seeing you all at future events and have a great night. And thank you.